Okay, good evening. Hello, hello. Um, as per usual, I do need to fix my um, captions. I noticed after I started the stream that they were the that the link had uh, timed out. So, yeah, there we go. All right. And now we get into 1984. So, um we're at chapter nine of part two. Um, and it was, I'm not sure, I kind of flipped ahead and I didn't understand what was going on with the formatting. So we'll just have to deal with that when we get to it. Um, so here we go. Winston was gelatinous with fatigue. Gelatinous was the right word. It had come into his head spontaneously. His body seemed to have not only the weakness of a jelly, but its translucence. He felt that if he held up his hand, he would be able to see the light through it. All the blood and lymph had been drained out of him by an enormous debauch of work, leaving only a frail structure of nerves, bones, and skin. All sensations seemed to be magnified. His overalls fretted his shoulders the pavement tickled his feet even the opening and closing of a hand was an effort that made his joints creak he had worked more than 90 hours in five days so had everyone else in the ministry now it was all over and he had literally nothing to do no party work of any description until tomorrow morning he could spend six hours in the hiding place and another nine in his own bed slowly in mild afternoon sunshine he walked up a dingy street in the direction of mr charrington's shop keeping one eye open for the patrols but irrationally convinced that this afternoon there was no danger of anyone interfering with him the heavy briefcase that he was carrying bumped against his knee at each step sending a ting sending a tingling sensation up and down the skin of his leg Inside it was the book, which he had now had in his possession for six days and had not yet opened, nor even looked at. On the sixth day of the hate week, 
uh, of hate week after the processions the speeches the shouting the singing the banners the posters the films the waxworks the rolling of drums and squealing of trumpets the tramp of marching feet the grinding of the caterpillars of tanks the roar of massed planes the booming of guns after six days of this when the great orgasm was quivering to its climax and the general hatred of eurasia had boiled up into such delirium that if the crowd could have got their hands on the two thousand eurasian war criminals who were to be publicly hanged on the last day of the proceedings they would unquestionably have torn them to pieces at just this moment it had been announced that oceania was not after all at war with eurasia oceania was at war with east asia eurasia was an ally there was of course no admission that any change had taken place merely it became known with extreme suddenness and everywhere at once that east asia and not eurasia was the the enemy winston was taking part in the demonstration in one of the central london squares at the moment when it happened it was night and the white faces and the scarlet banners were luridly floodlit the square was packed with several thousand people including a block of about a thousand school children in the uniform of the spies on a scarlet draped platform an orator of the inner party a small lean man with disproportionately long arms and a large bald skull over which a few lank locks straggled was haranguing the crowd a little rumpelstiltskin figure contorted with hatred he gripped the neck of the microphone with one hand while the other enormous at the end of a bony arm clawed the air menacingly above his head his voice made metallic by the amplifiers boomed forth on endless cattle an, an endless catalogue of atrocities massacres deportations lootings rapings torture of prisoners bombing of civilians lying propaganda unjust aggressions broken treaties it was almost impossible to listen to him without being first convinced and then maddened at every few moments the fury of the crowd boiled over and the voice of the speaker was drowned by a wild beast-like roaring that rose uncontrollably from thousands of throats the most savage yells of all came from the school children the speech had been proceeding for perhaps twenty minutes when a messenger hurried on to the platform and a scrap of paper was slipped into the speaker's hand he unrolled and read it without pausing in his speech nothing altered in his voice or manner or in the con content of what he was saying but suddenly the names were different without words said a wave of understanding rippled through the crowd oceania was at war with east asia the next moment there was a tremendous commotion the banners and posters with which the square was decorated were all wrong quite half of them had the wrong faces on them it was sabotage the agents of goldstein had been at work there was a riotous interlude while posters were ripped from the walls banners torn to shreds and trampled underfoot the spies performed prodigies of activity in clambering over the rooftops and cutting the streamers that fluttered from the chimneys but within two or three minutes it was all over the orator still gripping the neck of the neck microphone his shoulders hunched forward his free hand clawing at the air had gone straight on with his speech one minute more and the feral roars of rage were again bursting from the crowd the hate continued exactly as before except that the target had been changed the thing that impressed winston in looking back was that the speaker had switched from one line to the other actually in mid-sentence not only without a pause but without even breaking the syntax but at the moment he had other things to preoccupy him it was during the moment of disorder while the posters were being torn down that a man whose face he did not see had tapped him on the shoulder and said excuse me i think you've dropped your briefcase he took the briefcase abstractedly without speaking <clears throat> he knew that it would be days before he had the, an opportunity to look inside it the instant that the demonstration was over he went straight to the ministry of truth though the time was now nearly 23 hours the entire staff of the ministry had done likewise the orders already issuing from the telescreen recalling them to their posts were hardly necessary 
Oceania was at war with East Asia. Oceania had always been at war with East Asia. A large part of the political literature of five years was now completely obsolete. Reports and records of all kinds, newspapers, books, pamphlets, films, soundtracks, photographs, all had to be rectified at lightning speed. Although no directive was ever issued, it was known that the chiefs of the department intended that within one week, no reference to the war with Eurasia or the alliance with East Asia would remain in existence anywhere. The work was overwhelming, all the more so because the processes that it involved could not be called by their true names. Everyone in the record department worked 18 hours in the 24 with two three-hour snatches of sleep. Mattresses were brought up from the cellars and, and pitched all over the corridors. Meals consisted of sandwiches and victory coffee wheeled round on trolleys by attendants from the canteen. Each time that Winston broke off for one of his spells of sleep, he tried to leave his desk clear of work, and each time that he crawled back, sticky-eyed and aching, it was to find that another shower of paper cylinders had covered the desk like a snowdrift, half burying the speak right and overflowing onto the floor, so that the first job was always to stack them into a neat enough pile to give him room to work. What was worst of all was that the work was by no means purely mechanical. Often it was enough merely to substitute one name for another, but any detailed report of events demanded care and imagination. Even the ge geographical knowledge that one needed in transferring the war from one part of the world to another was considerable. <clears throat> By the third day his eyes ached, unbearably, and his spectacles needed wiping every few minutes. It was like struggling with some crushing physical task, something which one had the, the right to refuse and which one was nevertheless neurotically anxious to accomplish. In so far as he had time to remember it, he was not troubled by the fact that every word he murmured into the speak right, every stroke of his ink pencil, was a deliberate lie. He was as anxious as anyone else in the department that the forgery should be perfect. On the morning of the sixth day, the dribble of cylinders slowed down. For as much as half an hour, nothing came out of the tube. Then one more cylinder, then nothing. Everywhere at about the same time, the work was easing off. A deep and, as it were, were secret sigh went through the department. A mighty deed, which could never be mentioned, had been achieved. It was now impossible for any human being to prove by document documentary evidence that the war with Eurasia had ever happened. At 1200, it was unexpectedly announced that all workers in the ministry were free till tomorrow morning. Winston, still carrying the brief ta briefcase containing the book, which had remained between his feet while he worked and under his body while he slept, went home, shaved himself, and almost fell asleep in his bath, although the water was barely more than tepid. With a sort of voluptuous creaking in his joints, he climbed the stair above Mr. Charrington's shop, he was tired, but not sleepy any longer. He opened the window, lit the dirty little oil stove, and put on a pan of water for coffee. Julia would arrive presently. Meanwhile, there was the book. He sat down in the sluttish armchair, sluttish armchair? Okay. And undid the straps of the briefcase. A heavy black volume, amateurishly bound, with no name or title on the cover, the print also looked slightly irregular. The pages were worn at the edges and fell apart easily as though the book had passed through many hands. The inscription on the title ran, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism by Emmanuel Goldstein, Winston, uh, uh, by Emmanuel Goldstein, and it, sorry, sorry, it kind of ran together there. Winston began reading, Chapter 1, Ignorance is Strength. Throughout recorded time and probably since the end of the neolithic age there have been three kinds of oh, oh 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 i'm sorry sorry it looks like we're reading the book um at least part of it so yeah so it's gonna so let me start that over the theory and practice so this is the the book he just received the theory and practice of oligarchical collectivism by emmanuel goldstein Winston began reading. Chapter 1. Ignorance is Strength. 
Throughout recorded time, and probably since the end of the Neolithic Age, there have been three kinds of people in the world, the high, the middle, and the low. They have been subdivided in many ways. They have borne countless different names, and their relative numbers, as well as their attitude towards one another, have varied from age to age. But the essential structure of society has never altered. Even after enormous upheavals and seemingly irrevocable changes, the same pattern has always reasserted itself, just as a gyroscope will always return to equilibrium, however far it is pushed one way or the other. The aims of these groups are entirely ir irreconcilable. Winston stopped reading, chiefly in order to appreciate the fact that he was reading, in comfort and safety. He was alone, no telescreen, no ear at the keyhole, no nervous impulse to glance over his shoulder to cover the page with his hand. The sweet summer air played against his cheek. From somewhere far away there floated the faint sounds of children. In the room itself there was no sound except the insect voice of the clock. He settled deeper into the armchair and put his feet up on the fender. It was bliss. It was eternity. Suddenly, as one sometimes does with a book of which one knows that one will ultimately read and reread every word, he opened it at a different place and found himself at chapter 3. He went on reading. Chapter 3. War is Peace The splitting up of the world into the three great superstates was an event which could be and indeed was foreseen before the middle of the 20th century. With the absorption of Europe by Russia and the T British Empire by the United States, Two of the three existing powers, Eurasia and Oceania, were already effectively in being. The third, East Asia, only emerged as a district unit after another decade of confused fighting. The frontiers between the three superstates are in some places arbitrary, and in others they fluctuate according to the fortunes of war, but in general they follow geographical lines. Eurasia comprises the whole of the northern part of the European and Asiatic landmass, from Portugal to the Bering Strait. Oceania comprises the Americas, the Atlantic Islands, including the British Isles, Australasia, and the southern portion of Africa. East Asia, smaller than the others, and with a less definite western frontier, comprises China and the countries to the south of it, the Japanese islands, and a large but fluctuating portion of Manchuria, Mongolia, and Tibet. In one combination or another, these three superstates are permanently at war, and have been so for the past 25 years. War, however, is no longer the desperate, annihilating struggle that it was in the early decades of the 20th century. It is a warfare of limited aims between com combatants who are unable to destroy one another, have no ma material cause for fighting, and are not divided by any genuine ideological differences. This is not to say that either the conduct of war or the prevailing attitude towards it has become less bloodthirsty or more chivalrous. On the contrary, war hysteria is continuous and universal in all countries, and such acts as raping, looting, the slaughter of children, the reduction of whole populations to slavery, and reprisals against prisoners, which extend even to boiling and burying alive, are looked upon as normal, and when they are committed by one side and not by the enemy, meritorious. But in a physical sense, war involves very small numbers of people, mostly highly trained specialists, and causes comparatively few casualties. The fighting, when there is any, takes place on the vague frontiers whose whereabouts the average man can only guess at, or round the floating fortresses which guard strategic spots on the sea lanes. In the centers of civilization, war means no more than a continuous shortage of consumption goods and the occasional crash of a rocket bomb which may cause a few scores of deaths. War has, in fact, changed its character. More exactly, the reasons for which war is waged have changed in their order of importance. Motives which were already present to some small extent in the great wars of the early 20th century have now become dominant and are consciously recognized and acted upon. To understand the nature of the present war, for in spite of the regrouping which occurs every few years, it is always the same war, one must realize in the first place that it is impossible for it to be decisive. 
none of the three superstates could be definitively conquered even by the other two in combination. They are too evenly matched, and their natural defenses are too formidable. Eurasia is protected by its vast land spaces, Oceania by the wide by the width of the Atlantic and the Pacific, East Asia by the fecundity and industriousness of its inhabitants. Secondly, there is no longer, in a material sense, anything to fight about. With the establishment of self-contained economies in which production and consumption are geared to one another, the scramble for markets, which was a main cause of previous wars, has come to an end, while the competition for raw materials is no longer a matter of life and death. In any case, each of the three superstates is so vast that it can obtain almost all the materials that it needs within its own boundaries. Insofar as the war has a direct economic purpose, it is a war for labor power. Between the frontiers of the superstates, and not permanently in the possession of any of them, there lies a rough quadrilateral with its corners at Tangier, Brazzaville, Darwin, and Hong Kong, containing within it about a fifth of the population of the earth. It is for the possession of this thickly populated these thickly populated regions of the northern ice cap that the three powers are constantly struggling. In practice, no one power ever controls the whole of the disputed area. Portions of it are constantly changing hands, and it is the chance of seizing this or that fragment by a sudden stroke of treachery that dictates the endless changes of alignment. <clears throat> All of the disputed territories contain valuable minerals and some of them yield important vegetable products such as rubber, which is co in colder climates it is necessary to synthesize by comparatively expensive methods. But above all, they contain a bottomless reserve of cheap labor. Whichever power controls equatorial Africa or the countries of the Middle East or southern India or the, the Indonesian archipelago disposes also of the bodies of scores or hundreds of millions of ill-paid and hard-working coolies. The inhabitants of these areas, reduced more or less openly to the status of slaves, pass continually from conqueror to conqueror, and are expended like so much coal or oil in the race to turn out more armaments, to capture more territory, to control more labor power, to turn out more armaments... Oh, wait a minute. To capture more territory and so on indefinitely. It should be noted that the fighting really never really moves beyond the edges of the disputed areas. The frontiers of Eurasia flow back and forth between the basin of the Congo and the northern shore of the Mediterranean. The islands of the ocean of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific are constantly being captured and recaptured by Oceania or by East Asia. In Mongolia, the dividing line between, between Eurasia and East Asia is never stable. Round the pole, all three powers lay claim to enormous territories, which in fact are largely uninhabited and unexplored. But the balance of power always remains roughly even, and the territory which forms the heartland of each superstate always remains inviolate. Moreover, the labor of the exploited peoples round the equator is not really necessary to the world's economy. They add nothing to the wealth of the world, since whatever they produce is used for purposes of war, and the object of waging war is always to be in a better position in which to wage another war. By their labor, the slave populations allow the tempo of continuous warfare to be speeded up, but if they did not exist, the structure of world society and the process by which it maintains itself would not be essentially different. The primary aim of modern warfare, in accordance with the principles of doublethink, this aim is, sorry, uh, the primary aim of modern warfare, and then in parentheses, in accordance with the principles of doublethink, this aim is simultaneously recognized and not recognized by the directing brains of the inner party, end parentheses, is to use up the products of the machine without raising the general standard of living. 
Ever since the end of the 19th century, the problem of what to do with the per surplus of consumption goods has been latent in industrial society. At present, when few human beings even have enough to eat, this problem is obviously not urgent, and it might not have become so, even if no artificial process of, of destruction had been at work. The world of today is a bare, hungry, dilapidated place compared with the world that existed before 1914, and still more so if compared with the Im imaginary future to which the people of that period looked forward. In the early 20th century, the vision of a future society unbelievably rich, leisured, orderly, and efficient, a glittering, antiseptic world of glass and steel and snow-white concrete, was part of the consciousness of nearly every literate person. Science and technology were developing at a prodigious speed, and it seemed natural to assume that they would go on developing. This failed to happen partly because of the impoverishment caused by a long series of wars and revolutions, partly because scientific and technical progress depended on the empirical habit of thought, which could not survive in a strictly regimented society. As a whole, the world is more primitive today than it was 50 years ago. Certain backward areas have advanced, and various devices, always in some way connected with warfare and police espionage, have been developed. But experiment and invention have largely stopped, and the ravages of the atomic war of the 1950s have never been fully repaired. Nevertheless, the dangers inherent in the machine are still there. From the moment when the machine first made its appearance, it was clear to all thinking people that the need for human drudgery, and therefore to a great extent for human inequality, has dis had disappeared. If the machine were used deliberately for that end, hunger, overwork, dirt, illiteracy, and disease could be eliminated within a few generations, and in fact, without being used for any such purpose, but by a sort of automatic process, by producing wealth, which it was sometimes impossible not to distribute, and machi the machine did raise the living standards of the average human being very greatly over a period of about 50 years, at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries. But it was also clear that on an all-round increase in wealth threatened the destruction indeed in some sense was the destruction of a hierar hierarchical society in a world in which everyone worked short hours had enough to eat lived in a house with a bathroom and a refrigerator and possessed a motor car or even an aeroplane the most obvious and perhaps the most important form of inequality would ag would already have disappeared if it once became general wealth would confer no distinction. It was possible, no doubt, to imagine a society in which wealth, in the sense of personal possessions and luxuries, should be evenly distributed, while power remained in the hands of a small privileged caste. But in the practice, such a society could not long remain stable, for if leisure and security were enjoyed by all alike, the great mass of human beings, who are normally stupefied by poverty, would become literate and would learn to think for themselves, and when once they had done this, they would sooner or later realize that the privileged minority had no function and they would sweep it away. In the long run, a hierarchical society was only possible on a basis of poverty and ignorance. To return to the agricultural past, as some thinkers about the beginning of the 20th century dreamed of doing, was not a practicable solution. It conflicted with the tendency toward mechanization, which had become quasi-instinctive throughout almost the whole world, and moreover, any country which remained industrially backward was helpless in a military sense and was bound to be dominated, directly or indirectly, by its more advanced rivals. <clears throat> Nor was it a satisfactory solution to keep the masses in poverty by restricting the output of goods. This happened to be a great this happened to a great extent during the final phase of capitalism, roughly between nineteen twenty and nineteen forty. The economy of many countries was allowed to stagnate, land went out of cultivation, 
capital equipment was not added to, great blocks of the population were prevented from working and kept half alive by state charity. But this too entailed military weakness, and since the privations it inflicted were obviously unnecessary, it made opposition inevitable. The problem was how to keep the wheels of, of industry turning without increasing the real wealth of the world. Goods must be produced, but they must not be distributed, and in practice the only way of achieving this was by continuous warfare. The essential act of war is destruction, not necessarily of human lives, but of the products of human labor. War is a way of shattering to pieces or pouring into the stratosphere or sinking in the depths of the sea materials which might otherwise be used to make the masses too comfortable and hence in the long run too intelligent. Even when weapons of war are not actually destroyed, their manufacture is still a convenient way of expending labor power without producing anything that can be consumed. A floating fortress, for example, has locked up in it the labor that would build several hundred car cargo ships. Ultimately, it is scrapped as obsolete, never having brought any material benefit to anybody, and with fur further en enormous labors, another floating fortress is built. In principle, the war effort is always so planned as to eat up any surplus that might exist after meeting the bare needs of the population. In practice, the needs of the population are always underestimated, with the result that there is a chronic shortage of half the necessities of life. But this is looking on at, looked on as an advantage. It is de a deliberate policy to keep even the favored group somewhere near the brink of hardship. Because a general state of scarcity increases the importance of small privileges and thus magnifies the distinction between one group and another. But the standards of the early 20th century, even a member of the inner party lives an austere, laborious kind of life. Nevertheless, the few luxuries that he does enjoy, his large, well-appointed flat, the better texture of his clothes, the better quality of his food and drink and tobacco, his two or three servants, his private motor car or helicopter, set him in a different world from a member of the outer party, and the members of the outer party have a similar advantage in comparison with the submerged masses whom we call the proles. The social atmosphere is that of a besieged city where the possession of a lump of horse flesh makes the difference between wealth and poverty, and at the same time the consciousness of being at war and therefore in danger makes the handing over of all power to a small caste seem the natural, unavoidable condition of survival. War, it will be seen, accomplishes the necessary destruction, but accomplishes it in a psychologically acceptable way. In principle, it would be quite simple to waste the surplus labor of the world by building temples and pyramids, by digging holes and filling them up again, or even by producing vast quantities of goods and then setting them to fire, or setting fire to them, sorry. But this would provide only the economic and not the emotional basis for a hierarchical society. What is concerned here is not the mor moral of masses, or, sorry, morale of masses whose attitude is unimportant so long as they are kept steadily at work, but the morale of the party itself. Even the humblest party member is expected to be competent, industrious, and even intelligent within narrow limits, but it is also necessary that he should be a credulous and ignorant fanatic whose prevailing moods are fear, hatred, adulation, and orgiastic triumph. In other words, it is necessary that he should have the mentality appropriate to a state of war. It does not matter whether the war is actually happening, and since no decisive victory is possible, it does not matter whether the war is going well or badly. All that is needed is that a state of war should exist. The splitting of the intelligence which the party requires of its members, and which is more easily achieved in an atmosphere of war, is now almost universal. But the higher up the ranks one goes, the more marked it becomes. It is precisely in the inner party that war hysteria and hatred of the enemy are strongest. In his capacity as an administrator, it is often necessary for a member of the inner party to know that this or that item of war news is untruthful, and he may often be 
aware that the entire war is spurious and either not happening or is being waged for purposes quite other than the declared ones. But such knowledge is easily neutralized by the, by the technique of doublethink. Meanwhile, no inner party member waves for an instant in his wavers for an instant in his mystical belief that the war is real and that it is bound to end victoriously with Oceania, the undisputed master of the entire world. Wow, this excerpt from the book he's reading is long. All members of the inner party believe in this coming conquest as an article of faith. It is to be achieved either by gradually acquiring more and more territory and so building up an overwhelming preponderance of power or by the discovery of some new and unanswerable weapon. The search for new weapons continues unceasingly and is one of the very few remaining activities in which the inventive or speculative type of mind can find any outlet. In Oceania at the present day, science, in the old sense, has almost ceased to exist. In new speak, there is no word for science. The empirical method of thought on which all the scientific achievements of the past were founded is opposed to the most fundamental principles of Ingsoc. And even technological progress only happens when its products can in some way be used for the d diminution of human liberty. In all the useful arts, the world is either standing still or going backwards. The fields are cultivated with horse plows while books are written by machinery. But in matters of vital importance, meaning in effect war and police espionage, the empirical approach is still encouraged or at least tolerated. The two aims of the party are to conquer the whole surface of the earth and to extinguish once and for all the possibility of independent thought. There are therefore two great problems which the party is concerned to solve. One is how to discover against his will what another human being is thinking, and the other is how to kill several hundred million people in a few seconds without giving warning beforehand. Insofar as scientific research still continues, this is its subject matter. The scientist of today is either a mixture of psychologist and inquisitor, studying with real ordinary minuteness the meaning of facial expressions, gestures, and tones of voice, and testing the truth-producing effects of drugs, shock therapy, hypnosis, and physical torture, or he is a chemist, physicist, or biologist concerned only with such branches of his special subject as are relevant to the taking of life. In the vast laboratories of the Ministry of Peace and in the experimental stations hidden in the Brazilian forests or in the Australian desert or on lost islands of the Antarctic, the teams of experts are indefatigable, fatigably at work. Some are concerned simply with planning the logistics of future wars. Others devise larger and larger rocket bombs, more and more powerful explosives, and more and more impenetrable armor plating. Others search for new and deadlier gases or for soluble poisons capable of being produced in such quantities as to destroy the vegetation of whole continents, or for breeds of disease germs Im immunized against all possible antibodies. Others strive to produce a vehicle that shall bore its way under the soil like a submarine under the water, or an airplane as independent of its base as a sailing ship. Others explore even remoter possibilities, such as focusing the sun's rays through lenses suspended thousands of kilometers away in space, or producing artificial earthquakes and tidal waves by tapping the heat at the Earth's center. But none of these projects ever comes anywhere near realization, and none of the three superstates ever gains a significant lead on the others. What is more remarkable is that all three powers already possess in the atomic bomb a weapon far more powerful than any that their present researches are likely to discover. 
Although the party, according to its habit, claims the invention for itself, atomic bombs first appeared as early as the 1940s and were first used on a large scale about 10 years later. At that time, some, num some hundreds of bombs were dropped on industrial centers, chiefly in European Russia, Western Europe, and North America. The effect was to convince the ruling groups of all countries that a few more atomic bombs would mean the end of organized society and hence of their own power. Therefore, although not, no formal agreement was ever made or hinted at, no more bombs were dropped. All three powers merely continued to produce atomic bombs and store them up against a decisive opportunity which they all believe will come sooner or later and we meanwhile the art of war has remained almost stationary for 30 to 40 years helicopters are more used than they were formerly bombing planes had been largely superseded by self-propelled projectiles and the fragile movable battleship was given has given way to the almost unsinkable floating fortress but otherwise there has been little development the tank, the submarine, the torpedo, the machine gun, even the rifle and the hand grenade are still in use. And in spite of the endless slaughters reported in the press and on the telescreens, the desperate battles of the earlier wars in which hundreds of thousands or even millions of men were often killed in a few weeks have never been repeated. None of the three super states ever attempts any maneuver which involves the risk of serious defeat. When any large operation is undertaken, it is usually a surprise attack against an ally. The strategy that all three powers are following, or pretend to themselves that they are following, is the same. The plan is, by a combination of fighting, bargaining, and well-timed strokes of treachery, to acquire a ring of bases completely encircling one or another of the rival states, and then to sign a pact of friendship with that rival and remain on peaceful terms for so many years as to lull suspicion to sleep. During this time, rockets loaded with atomic bombs can be assembled at all the strategic spots. Finally, they will all be fired simultaneously, with effects so devastating as to make retaliation impossible. It will then be time to sign a pact of friendship with the remaining world power in preparation for another attack. This scheme, it is hardly necessary to say, is a mere daydream, impossible of realization. Moreover, no fighting ever occurs except in the disputed areas round the equator and the pole. No invasion of enemy territory is ever undertaken. This explains the fact that in some places the frontiers between the superstates are arbitrary. Eurasia, for example, could easily conquer the British Isles, which are geographically part of Europe. Or on the other hand, it would be possible for Oceania to push its frontiers to the Rhine or even to the Vistula. But this would violate the principle, followed on all sides, though never formulated, of cultural integrity. If Oceania were to conquer the areas that used once to be known as France and Germany, it would be necessary either to exterminate the inhabitants, a task of great physical difficulty, difficulty or to assimilate a population of about 100 million people. who, so far as technical development goes, are roughly on the oceanic level. The problem is the same for all three superstates. It is absolutely necessary to their structure that there should be no contact with the foreigners except, to a limited extent, with war prisoners and colored slaves. Even the official ally of the mo moment is always regarded with the darkest suspicion, war prisoners apart the average citizen of oceania never sees sets eyes on a citizen of either eurasia or east asia and he is forbidden the knowledge of foreign languages if he were allowed contact with the foreigners he would discover that they are creatures similar to himself and that most of what he has been told about them is lies the sealed world in which he lives would be broken, and the fear, hatred, and self-righteousness on which his moral, de mor sorry, morale depends might evaporate. 
It is therefore realized on all sides that however often Persia or Egypt or Java or Ceylon may change hands, the main frontiers must never be crossed by anything except bombs. <sighs> Under this lies a fact never mentioned aloud, but tacitly understood and acted upon. Namely, that the conditions of life in all three superstates are very much the same. In Oceania, the prevailing philosophy is called Ingsoc. In Eurasia, it is called Neo-Bolshevism. And in East Asia, it is called by a Chinese name usually translated as death worship, but perhaps better rendered as obliteration of the self. The citizen of Oceania is not allowed to know anything of the tenets of the other two philosophies, but he is taught to ex exacerbate them as ex wait a minute ex where did I get exacerbate out of that but he is taught to ex execrate them as barbarous outrages upon morality and common sense so what was this killer Rambo currently at work but I hope you have a great stream tonight yeah thank you very much um, have a good night at work. Um, hope it goes fast for you. Actually, the three philosophies are barely distinguishable, and the social systems which they support are not distinguishable at all. Everywhere there is the same pyramidal structure, the same worship of semi-divine leader, the same economy existing by and for continuous warfare it follows that the three super states not only cannot conquer one another but would gain no advantage by doing so on the contrary so long as they remain in conflict they prop one another up like three sheaves of corn and as usual the ruling groups of all three powers are simultaneously aware and unaware of what they are doing their lives are dedicated to world conquest, but they also know that it is necessary that the war should continue everlastingly and without victory. Meanwhile, the fact that there is no danger of conquest makes possible the de denial of reality, which is the special feature of Ingsoc and its rival systems of thought. Here it is necessary to repeat what has been said earlier, that by becoming continuous war, by becoming continuous, war has fundamentally changed its character. Whew. Wow, just going on and on and on and on. In past ages, a war almost by definition was something that sooner or later came to an end, usually in unmistakable victory or defeat. In the past, also, war was one of the main instruments by which human societies were kept in touch with physical reality. All rulers in all ages have tried to impose a false view of the world upon their followers, but they could not afford to encourage any illusion that tended to impair military efficiency. So long as defeat meant the loss of independence or some other result generally held to be undesirable, the precautions against the defeat had to be serious. Physical facts could not be ignored. In philosophy or religion or ethics or politics, two and two might make five, but when one was designing a gun or an airplane, they had to make four. Inefficient nations were always conquered sooner or later, and the struggle for efficiency was inimical to illusions. Moreover, to be efficient, it was necessary to be able to learn from the past, which meant having a fairly accurate idea of what had happened in the past. Newspapers and history books were, of course, always colored and biased, but falsification of the kind that is practiced today would have been impossible. War was a sure safeguard of sanity, and so far as the ruling classes were concerned, it was probably the most important of all safeguards. While wars could be won or lost, no ruling class could be completely irresponsible. But when war became literally continuous, it also becomes literally continuous. It also ceases to be dangerous. When war is continuous, there is no such thing as military necessity. 
technical progress can cease and the most palpable facts can be not denied or disregarded. As we have seen, researches that could be called scientific are still carried out for the purposes of war, but they are essentially a kind of daydreaming and their failure to show results is not important. Efficiency, even military efficiency, is no longer needed. Nothing is efficient in Oceania except the thought police. Since each of the three super states is unconquerable, each is in effect a separate universe within which almost any perversion of thought can be safely practiced. Reality only exerts its pressure through the needs of everyday life, the need to eat and drink, to get shelter and clothing, to avoid swallowing poison or stepping out of top story windows and the like. Between life and death and between physical pleasure and physical pain, there is still a distinction, but that is all. Cut off the contact with the outer world and the pace... Uh, sorry, my eyes kind of went buggy there for a minute. Cut off the contact with the outer world and with the past, the citizen of Oceania is like a man in interstellar space who has no way of knowing which direction is up and which is down. The rulers of such a state are absolute, as the pharaohs or the Caesars could not be. They are obliged to prevent their followers from starving to death in numbers large enough to be inconvenient, and they are obliged to remain at the same low level of military technique as their rivals. But once that minimum is achieved, they can twist reality into whatever shape they choose. The war... Therefore, if we judge it by the standards of previous wars, is merely an imposture. It is like the battles between certain ruminant animals whose horns are set at such an angle that they are incapable of hurting one another. But though it is unreal, it is not meaningless. It eats up the surplus of consumable goods, and it helps to preserve the special mental atmosphere that a hierarchical society needs. War, it will be seen, is now a purely internal affair. In the past, the ruling groups of all countries, although they might recognize their common interest and therefore limit the destructiveness of war, did fight against one another, and the victory always plundered the victor always plundered and vanquished. In our own day, they are not fighting against one another at all. The war is waged by each ruling group against its own subjects, and the object of the war is not to make or prevent conquests of territory, but to keep the structure of society intact. The very word war, therefore, has become misleading. It would probably be accurate to say that they that by becoming continuous war, p continuous war has ceased to exist. The peculiar pressure that is exerted on human beings between the Neolithic age and the early 20th century has disappeared and been replaced by something quite different. The effect would be much the same if the three superstates, instead of fighting one another, should agree to live in perpetual peace. Such inviolate with each inviolate within its own boundaries. For in that case, each would still be a self-contained universe, freed forever from the sobering influence of external danger. A peace that was truly permanent would be the same as a permanent war. This, although the vast majority of party members understand it only in a shallower sense, is the inner meaning of the party slogan, War is Peace. Winston stopped reading for a moment. Somewhere in remote distance, a rocket bomb thundered. The blissful feeling of being alone with the forbidden book in a room with no telescreen had not worn off. Solitude and safety were physical sensations mixed up somehow with the tiredness of his body, the softness of the chair, the touch of the faint breeze with, from the window that played upon his cheek. The book fascinated him, or more exactly, it reassured him. In a sense, it told him nothing that was new, but that was part of the attraction. It said what he would have said if it had not, if it had been possible for him to set his scattered thoughts in order. It was the product of a mind similar to his own, but enormously more powerful, more systematic, less fear-ridden, 
The best books he perceived are those that tell you what you know already. He had just turned back to chapter one when he heard Julia's footstep on the stair and started out of his chair to meet her. She dumped her brown tool bag on the floor and flung herself into his arms. It was more than a week since they had seen one another. I've got the book, he said as they disentangled themselves. Oh, you've got it? Good, she said without much interest and almost immediately knelt down beside the oil stove to make the coffee. They did not return to the subject until he had been in bed for half an hour. The evening was just cool enough to make it worthwhile to pull up the counterpane. From below came the familiar sound of singing and the scrape of boots on the flagstones. The brawny, red-armed woman whom Winston had seen there on his first visit was almost a fixture in the yard. There seemed to be no hour of daylight when she was not marching to and fro between the wash tub and the line, alt alternately gagging herself with clothes pegs and breaking forth into lusty song. Julia had settled down on her side and seemed to be already on the point of falling asleep. He reached out for the book which was lying on the floor and sat up against the bedhead. We must read it, he said. You too, all members of the Brotherhood have to read it. You read it, she said with her eyes shut. Read it aloud. That's the best way. Then you could explain it to me as I, as you get. The clock's hands said six, meaning 18. They had three or four hours ahead of them. He propped the book against his knees and began reading. Whew. <laughs> so now it looks like it's going to go into a long. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, let's see. Nope, it's going to go into another long excerpt from the book, it looks like. Uh, I am going to take a quick break. Because this... We haven't gotten through a chapter yet. Not even one chapter. And I've been reading for almost an hour. So uh, I'm going to take a few minutes break and I will be back.
Okay, welcome back. So, where was I? Starting page 253. The clock's hands said six meaning 18. They had three or four hours ahead of them. He propped the book against his knees and began reading. Chapter 1. Ignorance is Strength. Throughout recorded time, and probably since the end of the Neolithic age, there have been three kinds of people in the world, the high, the middle, and the low. They have been subdivided in many ways. They have borne countless different names, and their relative numbers, as well as their attitude towards one another, have varied from age to age but the essential structure of society has never altered. Even after enormous upheavals and seemingly irrevocable changes, the same pattern has always reasserted itself, just as a gyroscope will always return to equilibrium, however far it is pushed one way or the other. Julia, are you awake? said Winston. Yes, my love, I'm listening. Go on, it's marvelous. He continued reading. <clears throat> Excuse me. The aims of these three groups are entirely irreconcilable. The aim of the high is to remain where they are. The aim of the middle is to change places with the high. The aim of the low, when they have an aim, for it is an abiding characteristic of the low that they are too much crushed by drudgery to be more than intermittently conscious of anything outside their daily lives, is to abolish all distinctions and create a society in which all men shall be equal. Thus throughout history, a struggle which is the same in its main outlines recurs over and over again. For long periods, the high seem to be securely in power, but sooner or later, there always comes a moment when they lose either their belief in themselves or their capacity to govern efficiently, or both. They are then overthrown by the middle, who enlist the low on their side by pretending to, to, to them that they are fighting for liberty and justice. As soon as they have reached their objective, the middle thrust the low back into their old position of servitude, and themselves become the high. Presently, a new middle group splits off from the one of the other groups, or from both of them, and the struggle begins over again. Of the three groups, only the low are never even temporarily successful in achieving their aims. It would be an exaggeration to say that throughout history there has been no progress of a material kind. Even today, in a period of decline, the average human being is physically better off than he was a few centuries ago. But no advance in wealth, no softening of manners, no reform or revolution has ever brought human equality a millimeter nearer. From the point of view of the low, no historic change has ever meant much more than a change in the name of their masters. By the late 19th century, the recurrence of this pattern had become obvious to many observers. There then rose schools of thinkers who interpreted history as a cyclical process and claimed to show that inequality was the unalterable law of human life. This doctrine, of course, had always had its adherence, but in the manner in which it was now put forward, there was a significant change. In the past, the need for a hierarchical form of society had been the doctrine specifically of the high. It had been preached by kings and aristocrats and by the priests, lawyers, and the like, who were parasitical upon them. And it had, been, it, and it had generally been softened by, the, by promises of compensation in an imaginary world beyond the grave. The middle, so long as it was struggling for power, had always made use of such terms as freedom, justice, and fraternity. Now, however, the concept of human brotherhood began to be assailed by people who were not yet in positions of command, but merely hoped to be, so, to be so before long. In the past, the middle had made revolutions under the banner of equality, and then had established a fresh tyranny as soon as the old one was overthrown. The new middle groups, in effect, proclaimed their tyranny beforehand. Socialism, a theory which appeared in the early 19th century, and was the last link in a chain of thought stretching back to the slave rebellions of antiquity was still deeply infected by the utopianism of past ages 
but in each variant of socialism that appeared from about 1900 onwards, the aim of establishing liberty and equality was more and more openly abandoned. The new movements, which appeared in the middle, middle years of the century, Ingsoc in Oceania, Neo-Bolshevism in Eurasia, death worship, as it is commonly called, in East Asia, had the conscious aim of perpetuating unfreedom and inequality. These new movements, of course, grew out of the old ones and tended to keep their names and pay lip service to their, to their ideology. But the purpose of all of them was to arrest progress and freeze history at a chosen moment. The familiar pendulum swing was to happen once more and then stop. As usual, the high were to be turned out by the middle, who would then become the high. But this time, by conscious strategy, the high would be able to maintain their position permanently. The new doc doctrines arose partly because of the accumulation of historical knowledge and the growth of the historical sense, which had hardly existed before the 19th century. The cyclical movement of history was now intelligible, or appeared to be so, and if it was intelligible, then it was alterable. But the principal underlying cause was that as early as the beginning of the 20th century, human equality had become technically possible. It was still true that men were not equal in their native talents and that functions had to be specialized in ways that favored some individuals over others, but there was no longer any real need for class distinctions or for large differences of wealth. In earlier ages, class distinct distinctions had been not only inevitable but desirable. Inequality was the price of civilization. With the development of machine production, however, the case was altered. Even if it was still necessary for human beings to do different kinds of work, it was no longer necessary for them to live at different social or economic levels. Therefore, from the point of view of the new groups who were on the point of seizing power, human equality was no longer an ideal to be striven for, but a danger to be averted. In more primitive ages, when a just and peaceful society was in fact not possible, it had been fairly easy to believe it. The idea of an earthly paradise in which men could, should live together in a state of brotherhood, without laws and without brute labor, had haunted the human imagination for thousands of years. And this vision had had a certain hold even on the groups who actually profited by each historical change. The heirs of the French, English, and American revolutions had partly believed in their own phrases about the rights of man, freedom of speech, equality before the law, and the like, and have even allowed their conduct to be influenced by them to some extent. But by the fourth decade of the 20th century, all the main currents of political thought were authoritarian. The earthly paradise had been discredited at exactly the moment when it became reali realizable. Every new political theory, by whatever name it called itself, led back to hierarchy and regimentation, and in the general hardening of outlook that set in around about 1930, practices which had been long abandoned in some cases for hundreds of years, imprisonment without trial, the use of war prisoners as slaves, public executions, torture to extract confessions, the use of hostages, and the deportation of whole populations not only became common again, but were tolerated and even defended by people who considered themselves enlightened and progressive. It was only after a decade of national wars... Oh, here, hold on. Okay, uh, so there's a quote here. Tolerance will reach such a level that intelligent people will be banned from thinking so as not to offend the imbeciles. Russian auth author Fyodor Dostoevsky. Yeah, Dostoevsky. Yeah. All right. It was only after a decade of national wars, civil wars, revolutions, and counter-revolutions in all parts of the world that... Ingsoc and its rivals emerged as fully worked out political theories, but they had been foreshadowed by the various systems generally called totalitarian, which had appeared early in the century, and the main outlines of the world which would emerge from the prevailing chaos had long been obvious. What kind of people would control this world 
had been equally obvious. The new aristocracy was made up, for the most part, of bureaucrats, scientists, technicians, trade union organizers, publicity experts, sociologists, teachers, journalists, and professional politicians. Wow. These people, whose origins lay in the salaried middle class and the upper grades of the working class, had been shaped and brought together by the barren world of monopoly industry and centralized government. As compared with these opposite numbers in past ages, they were less avaricious, less tempted by luxury, hungrier for pure power, and above all, more conscious of what they were doing and more intent on crushing opposition. This last difference was cardinal. By comparison with the existing with that existing today, all the tyrannies of the past were half hearted and inefficient. The ruling groups were always infected to some extent by liberal ideas and were content to leave loose ends everywhere, to regard only the overt act and to be uninterested in what their subjects were thinking. Even the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages was tolerant by modern standards. Part of the reason for this was that in the past, no government had the power to keep its citizens under constant surveillance. The invention of print, however, made it easier to manipulate public opinion, and the film and the radio carried the process further. With the development of television and the technical advance, which made it possible to receive the and transmit simultaneously on the same instrument, private life came to an end. Every citizen, or at least every citizen important enough to be worth watching, could be kept for 24 hours a day under the eyes of the police and in the sound of official propaganda with all other channels of communication closed. The possibility of enforcing not only complete obedience to the will of the state, but complete uniformity of opinion on all subjects now existed for the first time. After the revolutionary period of the 50s and 60s, society regrouped itself, as always, into high, middle, and low. But the new high group, unlike its forerunners, did not act upon instinct, but knew what was needed to safeguard its position. It had long been realized that the only secure basis for oligarchy is collectivism. Wealth and privilege are most easily defended when they are possessed jointly. The so-called abolition of private property, which took place in the middle years of the century, meant, in effect, the concentration of property in far fewer hands than before. But with this difference, that the new owners were a group instead of a mass of individuals. Individually, no member of the party owns anything except petty personal belongings. Collectively, the party onion, oh, blah, the party owns everything in Oceania because it controls everything and disposes of the products as it thinks fit. In the years following the revolution, it was able to, to step into this commanding position almost unopposed because the whole process was represented as an act of collectivization. It had always been assumed that if the capitalist class were expro- expropriated, Socialism must follow, and unquestionably the capitalists had been expropriated. Factories, mines, land, houses, transport, everything had been taken away from them, and since these things were no longer private property, it followed that they must be public property. Ingsoc, which grew out of the earlier socialist movement and inherited its phraseology, has in fact carried out the main item in the socialist program, with the result foreseen and intended beforehand that economic inequality has been made permanent. But the problems of perpetuating a hierarchical society go deeper than this. There are only four ways in which a ruling group can fall from power. Either it is conquered from without, or it governs so inefficiently that the masses are stirred to revolt, or it allows a strong and discontented middle group to come into being, or it loses its own self-confidence and willingness to govern. These causes do not operate singly, and as a rule, all four of them are present in some degree. A ruling class which could guard against all of them would remain in power permanently. Ultimately, the determining factor is the mental attitude of the ruling class itself. 
After the middle of the present century, the first danger had in reality disappeared. Each of the three powers which now divide the world is in fact unconquerable and could only become conquerable through slow demographic changes which a government with wide powers can easily avert. The second danger also is only a theor theoretical one. The masses never revolt of their own accord, and they never revolt revolt merely because they are oppressed. Indeed, so long as they are not permitted to have standards of comparison, they never even become aware that they are oppressed. The recurrent economic crises of the past times were totally unnecessary and are not now permitted to happen, but other and equally less large dislocations can and do happen without having political results, because there is no way in which discontent can become articulate. As for the overproduction which has been latent in our society since the development of machine technique, it is solved by the device of continuous warfare, see chapter 3, which is also useful in keying up public morale to the necessary pitch. From the point of view of our present rulers, therefore, the only genuine dangers are the splitting off of a new group of able, underemployed, power-hungry people, and the gro growth of liberalism and skepticism in their own ranks. The problem, that is to say, is educational. It is a problem of continuously molding the consciousness both of the directing group and of the larger ex executive group that lies immediately below it. The con consciousness of the masses needs only to be influenced in a negative way. <clears throat> I am going to pause there and see how far do we need to go to get to the end of this chapter because we're still on the same chapter we started with an hour and a half ago. So Um, it goes all the way through until chapter, or I mean not chapter, part three begins, which is quite a ways down the road. Mm. Honestly, I think... I might just call it there. Let's see, make sure I know exactly where I went. Um, okay. Um, so that I have a very obvious place that I'm going to stop, I'm going to read about one more page worth. Given this background, one could infer, if one did not know it already, the general structure of oceanic society. At the apex of the pyramid comes Big Brother. Big Brother is infallible and all-powerful. Every success, every achievement, every victory, every scientific discovery, all knowledge, all wisdom, all happiness, all virtue are held to issue directly from its, his leadership and inspiration. Nobody has ever seen Big Brother. He is a face on the hoardings, a voice on the telescreen. We may be reasonably sure that he will never die, and there is already considerable uncertainty as to when he was born. Big Brother is the guise in which the party chooses to exhibit itself to the world. His function is to act as a focusing power to, for love, fear, and reverence. Emotions which are more easily felt towards an individual than towards an organization. Below Big Brother comes the inner party. Its numbers limited to six millions or something less than 2% of the population of Oceania. Below the inner party comes the outer party, which, if the inner party is described as the brain of the state, may be justly likened to the hands. Below that come the dumb masses whom we habitually refer to as the proles numbering perhaps 85% of the population. 
In the terms of our earlier classification, the proles are the low for the slave population of the equatorial lands who pass constantly from conqueror to conqueror are not a permanent or necessary part of the structure. In principle, membership of these three groups is not hereditary. The child of inner party parents is, in theory, not born into the inner party. Admission to either branch of the party is by examination, taken at the age of 16. Nor is there any racial discrimination or any marked domination of one pr province by an, another. Jews, Negroes, South Americans, and pure Indian blood are to be found in the highest ranks of the party, and the administrators of any area are always drawn from the inhabitants of that area. In no part of Oceania do the inhabitants have the feeling that they are a colonial population ruled from a distant capital. Oceania has no capital, and its titular head is a person whose whereabouts nobody knows, except that English is its chief lingua franca and news speak its official language. It is not centralized in any way. Its rulers are not held together by blood ties, but by adherence to a common doctrine. It is true that our society is stratified and very rigidly, rigidly stratif stratified on what at first sight appear to be hereditary lines and that's where i'm going to leave it where uh, that puts us on page 263 um of the actual book uh, and uh we're 67 percent through the book so that's where we're at we'll leave it off there i'm going to um end this session as i usually do and come back for at least a, yeah, you know what? No, I actually don't feel like gaming tonight. I'm going to skip it. Um, I'm just going to leave off there and chill out for tonight. So I will see you all tomorrow night for, um, a couple more Star Wars comics and then some, um, Hogwarts Legacy. I will see you then.